Our next speaker in this session, ladies and gentlemen, is a consultant neurosurgeon specialised in pre-hospital care, working at both Imperial College and the London Air Ambulance. He's also worked extensively overseas, including as an expedition doctor on Arctic and Everest missions, and even as a researcher for NASA. With his na aptly named talk, Caring Outside the Box, please welcome to stage, Mark Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. There's quite a lot of you, isn't there? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm incre incredibly privileged to do the job I do. Uh, I look after sick people. Um, and I sometimes get frustrated because I think we can deliver better care. And that's what I want to talk about, if that's okay. A couple of concepts, really. One is the timing of care, and the other is having time to care. And um, I'm going to tell or share with you a few stories, if that's okay. This is the first one. Oh, that's not the first one. That's the first one. <laughs> um, this is my gran. And um, she's fitting well, 90-year-old, lives alone, self-caring, independent, all good stuff. And this is a beautiful Midsummer's Day last year. And um, I think I'll just explain to you, I'm a neurosurgeon most days. I also work with London's Air Ambulance, so I'm supposed to be good at resuscitation. She suddenly collapses to the floor. And um, I think what I'm going to tell you is going to worry you about my immediate reaction to this. My immediate reaction was, wow, what a wonderful way to die. And <laughs> so this, this isn't funny, this is my grand. Sorry, <laughs> it's a lecture about caring, yeah? A bit of consideration, yeah? Thank you. <laughs> so I thought, um, God, what a wonderful day to die. You know, this is near perfect death in the sense that um, you know, surrounded by your family, beautiful day. And um, so I didn't think about doing cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And since I wasn't going to do CPR, I didn't think about checking a pulse. Um, Maybe this isn't a good example of care. I guess care is, care is a bit complicated, isn't it? And uh, well, shall I move on to another uh, example? And this is Dan. This isn't going very well. Uh, Dan uh, is a patient. Uh, he was a guy who um, wrapped his car around a tree in 2011, 20-year-old. And um, he had a brain injury. So he's, he's quite useful for me. I'm supposed to know about brain injuries. So I can tell you about concepts regarding that. And the first concept I want to talk about is something called primary brain injury. Primary brain injury is the injury that happens at the moment of impact, when your head hits that windscreen. And there's not a lot I can do about that as a neurosurgeon. That's the realm of politicians to, you know, seatbelt laws, helmets, road safety, those kind of things, public, public health measures. Everything that happens after the primary injury, though, is called secondary injury. And that's the loss of the airway, it's hypotension from bleeding out, it's, um, uh, uh, it's the expanding hematoma inside your head. Now, all those things, I'm supposed to do something about, as a neurosurgeon, as paramedics, as nurses, that's our, that's our job. And the best time to minimize secondary brain injury is in the first few minutes after the accident. Once brain is dead, it's dead. And I have this saying as a result of that, which is that if you're not dead when we get to you, you shouldn't die. But patients like Dan do die, and they die because at the moment we're not brilliant. We're not absolutely 100% at managing these secondary injuries. And um, um, I think this is a, an area which in the future is going to become a real possibility that we can do this. So anyway, Dan was um, uh, found a few feet from his car. London's air ambulance arrived. Uh, this is in the early hours of the morning. They found him to be profoundly unconscious, so much so they could intubate him without really using much in the way of drugs. Um, they brought him to a hospital just around the corner from here. And I want you to imagine when these patients arrive. Um, often, you know, we're doing the breathing for them, uh, uh, their pulse and blood pressure is fine, their arms and legs aren't hanging off, uh, there's no blood anywhere, they might have a little bit of bump on the head. They don't look that sick, but they are really sick. Inside their head is a time-critical emergency going on. They need an urgent CT now, and then, if appropriate, they need an urgent operation. So Dan went straight to CT, and it showed that he had something called a subdural hematoma. That's a blood clot on the outside of the brain, pushing over the brain, so much so that his pupils were no longer working, and that, that's a pretty, pretty bad brain injury. We took him straight to theatre. Now, I'll come back to Dan a bit, a bit later. I said at the start it's a real privilege to look after these patients, and I want to explain why it's a privilege. Brain injury isn't like other injuries. It's not like losing an arm or a leg. You're still you, if that happens. But brain injury changes the person, and in my clinic, I see patients all the time, or relatives rather, who come and say, well, Johnny's not what he was. You know, he's not the man I married. This has a huge social and economic impact, as well as affecting uh, the person and their families. I'm really passionate about this, about making sure that we maintain people as they are. 
And if you are passionate about something, and if you uh, are open-minded, I think you can go on really interesting journeys. So I'd just like to share another couple of stories with you about research sort of journeys that I've been on, uh, which I think have taught me a huge amount. The first is in the 1990s. I was very fortunate. I went to work for a bunch of really cool uh, scientists at NASA, looking at the ways of measuring pressure inside astronauts' heads. Now, What's that got to do with the price of fish, you're probably wondering. Well, it's, it's very interesting. When astronauts go into space, about 70% of them suffer with something called space adaptation syndrome, or space motion sickness. This is where they vomit in the first uh, one to four days of space flight. It's unpleasant, it's costly to NASA. So they really wanted to find out why this occurred. And the theory was, was that in space, you haven't got gravity pulling blood into your legs, it all sits in your chest and in your head, and the pressure goes up. It's a bit like hanging upside down. It makes you feel unwell and you vomit. So they wanted to find a non-invasive way of measuring intracranial pressure. It just so happens this is really important in my day job as a neurosurgeon as well. This concept of intracranial pressure is fundamental to pretty much everything we do. It was actually put forward in 1783 by uh, a chap called Alexander Monroe, and it hasn't really changed. He said that if you put something in your head, something else has to come out, otherwise the pressure will go up. Makes sense, doesn't it? Closed box. So if I do a craniotomy, which is a, uh, an opening on the side of my head here, take a bit of bone out and put a golf ball in, put the bone back, I have to squeeze out some brain fluid, some CSF and some venous blood, and the pressure stays the same. It goes down my spinal canal. If I try and put another golf ball in, then that kind of buffering capacity is lost, and, and then the pressure goes up. And that, that can be pretty devastating for patients. So this is a, a really fundamental concept, not just for uh, neurosurgery, but also for NASA. And it's very difficult to measure the pressure inside your head without drilling a hole in it, and NASA aren't very keen on drilling holes in astronauts' heads. It's, it's fine as a child, you can measure the fontanelle, you know, the little thing there. Once that closes over, it's all a closed box. I'll come back uh, to NASA uh, a little bit later. There was another study uh, that I was very fortunate to be involved with. This was a study in 2007 as part of the Caldwell Extreme Everest Group. We took uh, 200 people up to Everest Base Camp and another 14 on the mountain uh, to look at the effects of hypoxia. Now, many patients on intensive care suffer with hypoxia, that means luck, lack of oxygen. And they suffer that because of chest infections or something called ARDS, where your, your lungs don't work very well. But it's really difficult to study these patients. Basically, there's lots of different types of uh, injuries going on. It's even worse in brain injury patients because there's so many different injuries. So somebody's been hit by a bus, someone's been hit by a hammer, someone's had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Lots of different types of injury to lots of different parts of the brain. And unfortunately, it's not ethical to randomly, prospectively hit people over the head with a hammer in some kind of nice, controlled way. So we need another model of brain injury. And taking people up mountains and giving them a reversible, hypoxic model of a brain injury is, is, is perfectly ethical. So, so it is. Well, they get better. And they're on holiday, anyway. Um, so we took all these people up. And we were really interested in looking at the cerebral blood flow, the blood flow in and out of your head. Now, sitting here, you've probably got about 700 mils per minute going into your cranium. If you scoop your brain out, your total cranial volume is about 1,300 mils. So in just over a minute, without your brain in there, you would fill your entire cranium of blood. It's quite a lot of blood, isn't it? People forget you have to drain that blood as well, and that's what I was interested in. So take it from me, I can't go through the whole study uh, in a couple of minutes, but when, you go, when you're hypoxic, you increase your cerebral blood flow even further, massively. And we wanted to look at the venous drainage side of stuff. And, in, and one of the ways of doing that is to look in people's eyes. It's a bit of a window on the brain. If you look at the backs of people's eyes, you see that they get retinal venous distension. And oh, some of them get, about 30% of people, get uh, uh, hemorrhages like this as well. This was a really interesting phenomenon. And so much so that when we came back down to sea level, we thought we'd check it out and see what's actually going on inside people's brains using MRI scans. And we um, performed these MRI scans. Normal oxygen, so the normal oxygen level around you is about 21%. If we give people half the normal amount of oxygen, uh, 11%, we see this. These are two scans which are specifically showing up the venous system. And you can see that your venous system distends. It gets bigger. This is a really interesting concept. And the only way I can explain it, really, is using a, a bath analogy. You know, you've got the bath there, you turn the taps on, the water level sits about here. And if you turn the taps on even, hard, you know, even fir firmer, the more water comes out and the water level rises. It's because you've still got a plug hole, the same plug hole there. And it's the same thing going on inside your head, increasing cerebral blood flow, and you can't drain it um, quick enough. Now, the really interesting thing for me is that I see this in my patients on intensive care. Uh, I see not just the problems with pressure due to swelling inside their head, but things outside the head, outside the closed box, can also cause pressure to go up inside the head. So tight cervical collars, uh, people who have got um, a chest infection, as we've already said, people who've got hypoxia, even people who've got things going on in their abdomen can have a rise in intracranial pressure. 
There's another group of patients that are really interesting to me, and these are patients with something called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. You know, there's not going to be a test at the end, don't worry. It's a long word, but these are people who are usually fairly fat, and they've got um, big chests, big abdomens, and this excess pressure stops them from draining enough venous blood out of their head. And sometimes you can go up with a stent and, and um, um, improve their venous drainage a bit, but these people can actually go blind with this disease. What happens is they often present with a bit of a headache, and they start losing their peripheral vision. And it is serious. They, they do go blind unless we treat them. I've been in touch and stayed friends with my uh, NASA colleagues for all this time now, and a really interesting thing happened about three years ago. Astronauts started spending longer in space, not the one to two weeks they spend on the shuttle, but actually um, uh, six months, even a year. And they started reporting loss of peripheral vision, which is the same as my patients. And I found this, um, and, you know, that the, the, there's this constant loop of what you learn from extreme physiology, critical care, uh, and back to extreme physiology again. This is a really interesting field. And I would say to anyone who is, who's, who's a budding scientist who or wants inspiration to do something, go off the beaten track. Currently, genetics, genomics, molecular medicine, all, they're all king. That's what gets you nature, nature papers. But extreme physiology still has so much to give us. There's a group of uh, patients where they really do have extreme physiology. These are the patients in the pre-hospital care environment immediately after their accident. It's an area that we currently don't do much research in because it's difficult. Firstly, we're often not there because it happens before we get there. And secondly, when we do get there, it's often dangerous. Like, you know, the environment might be dangerous, it might be raining. It's not conducive to research, not like uh, intensive care in places like that. But it's an area where I think we can make a massive difference. If we can intervene at this early stage and pre preserve neurons, then the outcomes would be better. So how did Dan do? Well, um, Dan, I've got a picture of Dan. There we go, there's Dan. So Dan was on our unit for six weeks and on intensive care, and we did everything we possibly could to lower the pressure inside his head. And um, I should just explain, this isn't, a, you know, this isn't a rare disease, this is a really common disease. I've done a ward round this morning on the unit, and we've got 10 patients very similar to Dan. That's 10 families all worried. Multiply that across London, this is a significant number of people. If I tell you that trauma is the commonest cause of death worldwide, and brain injury is the commonest cause of that death, you begin to get an idea of the scale of this problem. And that's under, in the under 45, sorry, I should have said that. And this is, that's not, it's not just death, these are a lot of people living with brain injury as well, which are, which are not included in that figure. Dan made a really good recovery. And uh, I'm pleased to say that he's uh, with his girlfriend, I think, sitting over there, Sinead at the moment, who's stuck with him all through the whole thing. And he's now back at work and pretty much returned to a, a normal life. Now, I wanted to, in the last couple of minutes, talk a little bit about uh, the care that Dan received, if that's OK. Dan went through a system of care, pre-hospital care, in emergency care, intensive care, surgery, which doesn't have the word care in it, but we do care, and, and then rehab. Honestly, we do. Um, and I believe that everyone who does this job, goes into this, cares. It's the most valuable thing that we do. But it doesn't appear on any tariff. In, you know, it doesn't have a value to actually put on it. And therefore, I struggle with the concept of quality of care. What makes good quality care? And is it about living longer? Well, I don't know. Is it about quality of life? I've been fortunate enough to work in a number of different environments, and I really have come to a bit of a conclusion that culture has got something to do with it. If you're treated the way you would expect for your culture, you're getting good care. I spent some time working in Dharamsala, which is the home of Tibetan medicine in North India now. And um, patients used to come in with a chronic cough, and uh, uh, they're coming time and time again. Eventually, after about three months uh, of having some mineral and herbal medication, the, the, the Tibetan doctor would say, um, I think you need to go to the Western Hospital because I think you've got TB. And they go to the Western Hospital, and they get their anti-TB medication, they get better. And they were really happy with their care because it was appropriate, you know, the Tibetan medicine, first of all. Now, I work in the Western world now, and patients see me with brain tumors, and we operate on them, we give them chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and eventually there isn't much more we can do. And then they turn to Tibetan medicine or another form of medicine, but again, they're really happy with their care because the care is appropriate they got from their culture, uh, first of all. So what's happening is, is culture changing? Are people becoming more educated? Uh, you know, are people having higher demands on, of what they expect for healthcare? You've probably heard that healthcare is becoming unaffordable. You all heard that, yeah? And it's because of aging, you know, blame old people. And it's, I can't really understand this because um, I thought the idea of good, give, giving good care was that people would live longer. Uh, so I guess the answer is not to give such good care and then it will become, we'll be able to cope again. But um, you often hear this from organizations that aren't truly independent. 
They've got a reason to say that okay, healthcare is getting expensive, and that's the reason of then giving advice on how to make healthcare more efficient. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for healthcare efficiency, but we need to be careful about how we drive that efficiency. The world is, is changing. We're, we're changing from a system of health care to health service. And with that is, uh, you know, you see this all the time, uh, 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 service level agreements, various contracts between purchase and providers. And I'm worried that sometimes these miss off the concept of care. As I said to you, it's, it's the most valuable thing we do, but it doesn't appear on any tariff. I see healthcare professionals focus change from caring for patients to caring for targets. And I don't always know that they're the same thing. If you're trying to draw, you know, drive healthcare efficiency, which means doing a certain number of things per unit time or per unit cost, patient procedures, seeing number of patients, whatever it might be, and you squeeze that down to become more efficient, the one thing that might get squeezed out is care. And I say that because healthcare professionals need to have time and space to care. It's this human relationship, doctor-patient relationship. We mustn't lose it. Voltaire said that the art of medicine was um, entertaining patients whilst nature takes its course. And I really believe that. You call it entertaining, call it caring. It's fundamental to what we do. It's what makes us who we are. Aung San Suu Kyi said that Burma is a poor country, but rich in care. And I really believe this. Care doesn't have to cost very much. If you look around us today at all the inventions that we're seeing, remote technologies which will mean that we can deliver care more efficiently, so you know, remote, uh, rem uh, remote things such as Skype consultations, doctors in our pockets, on-scene, uh, Google Glass, things like this, these are technologies that aren't particularly expensive. They are, they're available to us now. And I think they will help us deliver care, enable us to deliver care. They're not the caring thing themselves. They will enable us to give that care more effectively. So, um, what about my gran, who you all think I don't care about? Well, she just fainted, and she's done absolutely fine, and she's sitting over there in the audience with my wife somewhere. So, I just want to end this talk by saying thank you to my gran for surviving, and especially for, si for surviving the last 24 hours, otherwise I would have had to write my talk again, and it would have been really awkward. And, and, and also thank you to you all for listening. Thank you.